We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. I'm going to talk today about how to feed 10 billion people. Much of what I'll be describing is the result of a commission that I co-chaired with Johan Rockström from the Resilience Center in Stockholm. This was funded by the Wellcome Trust, which allowed us to bring together 35 scientists from 17 different countries. And that brought together expertise from many different disciplines that were clearly needed to take on this challenge. The challenge was great. How can we feed what will be about 9.8 billion people in 2050, a diet that is both healthy and sustainable? Already today, we're not where we should be. About 2 billion people around the world lack key micronutrients. Many millions of children are stunted and over 2 billion adults are overweight or obese. The obesity epidemic is probably the most conspicuous indicator of what's happening on the nutrition side. We have today about 42% of Americans are obese, whereas back in 1970, this was only about 10%, so a huge increase over time. But it's not just the United States that is experiencing this obesity. This is the prevalence of overweight and obesity around the world. Uh, as you can see on the top, uh, these are the affluent countries, and there's been a steady increase going back here from 1980. But if we look at low-income countries on the bottom, these are actually increasing uh, in prevalence at an even greater uh, rate. So there is a, uh, projected to be a uh, convergence down the road. This is really a global problem. But of course, we can't just look at the averages there are huge disparities uh, within countries as well as between countries. Uh, this is showing life expectancy in the United States in the middle are uh, the white population and the overall population average uh, and what's happened during the pandemic. And you can see even before the pandemic, there was a, dec a decline in life expectancy in all groups, but uh, there were huge differences in life expectancy then, and now uh, the African-American population has lost about three years of life expectancy projected compared to the white population. So the gaps have increased even further. This is happening in many countries, but uh, it's not universal, and that's important because that means that declines in life expectancy are, are not inevitable. These are data from the upper income countries, and uh, you can see at the bottom, the United States has been lagging in life expectancy quite a while, while it's been steadily going up in Japan, both in men and in women. On the environmental side, the challenges are perhaps even greater. Uh, we've seen uh, increases in global average temperatures from year to year. And what's really troublesome here is not that there are just increases, but there's acceleration. And we're reaching a point where we're entering vicious circles, whereas uh, the world gets warmer, that releases more methane gas from a permafrost from the Arctic Ocean that speeds up warming and this cycle is going faster and faster. So against that background, our commission faced a very uh, serious challenge. 
And how to address this was something we thought about for a while. Ultimately, we broke this down into four steps. First of all, defining a healthy reference diet using the best available evidence from all kinds of studies. Then we define planetary boundaries using environmental systems, uh, in particular related to greenhouse gas, cropland use, water use, nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizer application, and uh, looking at extinction rates. And then we used a global food systems modeling framework to analyze whether what we identified as a healthy diet could be produced within planetary boundaries. And finally, we looked at strategies to stay within those boundaries. I'm going to use protein sources as an example, since I can't, uh, uh, within this time limit, look at all of the major food groups. Uh, but protein sources are particularly important because our choices among them have great implications for both health and nutrition and uh, climate change as well. Uh, if we look at beef, for example, the, the ratio of polyunsaturated to saturated fat is extremely low. Uh, poultry has quite a bit more polyunsaturated fat, salmon more. But if we really want higher ratios of polyunsaturated to saturated fat, we need to go to plant protein sources like nuts, soy products, and lentils. And we know that ratio is important because it reduces uh, blood cholesterol if we have a higher PS ratio. Our colleagues in Germany uh, took this a step further and looked at the uh, relationship between various uh, protein sources and food groups and, and uh, cardiovascular risk factors. So this is a summary of 66 randomized trials with risk factors as outcomes. These included uh, blood lipids, indicators of glucose homeostasis, blood pressure, and inflammatory factors. And then from the effects of each food group on all of these risk factors, they created a risk score and then ranked the foods. Uh, the best foods were nuts, followed by legumes, whole grains, fish, fruits and vegetables, refined grains, then uh, red meat being lower. These are less healthy foods now, eggs, dairy, and sugar-sweetened beverages, which have no nutritional value. Another kind of study we used uh, was long-term follow-up studies. And our group has been conducting these kind of cohort studies back since the 1970s. The first was a nurse's health study in which we enrolled 121,000 women and have tracked diet since 1980, then uh, identifying incident cases of cardiovascular disease, cancer, and other outcomes. And we were able to control for many potential confounding variables like smoking, physical activity, medication use, and family history. That was all women. So we enrolled about 52,000 men in a similar study starting in 1986, then another 116,000 women in 19. 89. Again, tracking diet over time risk factors and incidences of all major diseases. And I would point out this is the work of many uh, individuals. It's a very multidisciplinary set of projects. Uh, these are data looking at, again, uh, major protein sources here in relation to total mortality. We've combined cohorts. So this is over 130,000 people followed for several decades and among them about uh, 33,000 died during this period. So we had a lot of uh, statistical power. And all of these foods are compared to dairy foods. And it's really important to have uh, a specific comparison. Uh, the worst, uh, not surprisingly, was processed meat and eggs, uh, then unprocessed red meat, fish and poultry were pretty similar to dairy. But if we really wanted to go to low mortality, that meant emphasizing plant protein sources like nuts, legumes, and soy products, and very consistent with what we saw looking at the shorter term randomized controlled trials with risk factors as an outcome. So together, that kind of evidence creates a very strong uh, body of evidence to support shifting to a more plant-based topic, uh, plant-based diet for health reasons. But it's not just important to have this ranking, uh, we really need to look at dose response relationships to identify what would be an optimal amount of uh, intake of each food group. Here we used uh, the combination of over 200,000 men and women, among whom 13,000 developed incident type 2 diabetes during the several decades of follow-up. 
And even by just going from the first to second quintile, we saw a significant increase, small but statistically significant increase in risk of type 2 diabetes. The overall relationship was quite linear. So we didn't want to recommend this increment, so we somewhat arbitrarily took the midpoint of this uh, first increment. <clears throat> this corresponded to about one serving of red meat per week. After going through all of the major food groups, we put the data together and came up with what we called the healthy reference diet. And I'll run through some of these numbers quickly. Uh, this meant that uh, there was quite a flexible amount of whole grains that were possible, but what's really important is that they be whole grains, not refined grains. Uh, potatoes have a less advantageous health uh, profile, so we kept that number pretty low, about five servings of fruits and vegetables per day. Uh, dairy is pretty interesting because there are health benefits, and we specified a range from zero to 500, and all the animal source proteins have a possibility of zero because we know a vegan diet can be healthy. Uh, but we found uh, this is about uh, one, uh, this is about two glasses of milk per day at uh, 500 grams per day. If we uh, had the whole world go to two servings of dairy a day, we couldn't stay within planetary boundaries. So we used the midpoint of that range, about one serving of dairy a day. I already mentioned that red meat uh, would be about one serving per week. Uh, poultry uh, better from a health perspective. So about two servings per week. Uh, eggs, about two eggs per week, fish twice a week, which does have some positive health benefits because of the omega-3 fatty acids, but mostly emphasizing uh, plant protein sources like uh, beans, lentils, peas, uh, soy, and nuts. Uh, fat intake is, if it's healthy fats, mostly unsaturated fats, quite a bit of flexibility about that. And we kept artificial, we kept out sugar sweetened beverages and other sources of added sugar low which would mean about 5% of energy from, pro, from sugar or less. Uh, and even if we go to one soda serving per day, we would be over that limit. That's a lot of numbers pretty quickly, but it does boil down to something actually pretty simple when it comes to protein sources, uh, one plus one, and most people can get that, uh, meaning about one serving of dairy a day if you like it, and about one serving of other protein sources per day, some combination of fish, poultry, eggs, or red meat. This has been called a flexitarian diet, and it could be that you are a vegan. This is a, a sort of maximal amount, but um, it does provide a lot of variety for people who would like to have some animal sources of protein in their diet. And that would, of course, be on a base of nuts, soy, beans, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, uh, plant, and uh, plant oils. Is this realistic? As it turns out, it's actually very similar to the traditional Mediterranean diet that Greek men were consuming in the 1960s when they had the highest life expectancy in the world. The amount of uh, red meat plus poultry, 35 grams per day in Crete in the 60s, our reference diet came out to be 43 grams of protein per day, so very similar. But these foods can be put together in diets that are very uh, consistent with traditional diets from most places around the world. This happens to be a Vietnamese diet that encompasses this combination of uh, fruits, vegetables, uh, some whole grains, and mostly plant protein sources. But if you wanted some animal source proteins, some fish or other sources in moderation would be fine. So where do we stand today? Uh, if we look around the world, this uh, vertical line here represents the targets that I've described. Uh, but there's incredible heterogeneity if we look across regions. North America, for example, is way over the reference amount for red meat, but Sub-Saharan Sub Africa is way over the reference diet in terms of starchy vegetables. And this is mainly due to poverty diets that where these vegetables can uh, provide most of the calories in a diet that's otherwise quite unbalanced. And what's really important though is that most regions of the world are short in terms of fish, vegetables, fruits, legumes, whole grains, and, and nuts. So moving toward a healthy diet doesn't mean just reducing unharmful things. It, it means increasing uh, health-promoting aspects of diet. We did some analyses using three different modeling systems to see how much mortality would change 
if everyone shifted to the healthy targets that we described. And basically, they all showed similarly that uh, we would prevent about 3 million premature deaths per year, or about 19 to 24% of total mortality by the whole world shifting to that, those healthy diets. On the environmental side, we also looked at a summary of data on life cycle analyses. Uh, specifically here, uh, for example, looking at how much greenhouse gas per serving would be produced for each serving of different food groups. Red meat, I think, not surprisingly, was the worst. And soy and legumes were uh, the best protein sources, along with nuts. But the difference was huge. Red meat is about 140 times greater amount of greenhouse gas production compared to these plant protein sources. Pork, chicken, fish, dairy, eggs are quite a bit less greenhouse gas promoting than red meat, but still these are about 30 to 40 times the amount of greenhouse gas per serving compared to plant protein sources. And fruits, vegetables, cereals all have quite low environmental footprints with respect to greenhouse gas emissions. Putting this all together, looking at greenhouse gas emissions, we found that the planetary boundaries that were defined suggest that, that we could produce about five gigatons per year of greenhouse gas emissions from the food systems. Uh, but by 2010, we were already a little bit over that number. And if we continued on the business as usual track that we're on now today, with more population being added, about 2.5 billion people by 2050, and more meat consumption, we'd be about double the sustainable amount of greenhouse gas emissions. But if we adopted the target numbers that I described, we'd be back just about at the planetary boundaries. And if we improve production methods and reduced waste, we would be under the limits for greenhouse gas emissions, or, which is where we would like to be, of course. We went through this for the other indicators of sustainability. I won't go through those numbers now, but the point being that we not only need to shift to the, these dietary targets, but also incorporate better agricultural production methods and substantially reduce food waste if we're going to remain within stable limits for all of these other indicators of sustainability. And to put this in the even bigger picture of the IPCC pathway to staying under two degrees centigrade increase, we of course need to fundamentally eliminate fossil fuel emissions uh, used by industry, uh, energy production, uh, uh, buildings, transportation. Uh, and the food sector looks sort of small here in comparison to these other sectors. But if we continue on our business as usual path and we reduce fossil fuel emissions, we'll still not be able to stay within the Paris climate uh, agreement uh, limits. And we're also counting on the agriculture and food systems to have negative emissions. In other words, carbon sequestration in ways that we don't yet really quite know how to do. So to conclude, feeding 10 billion people a healthy diet within safe planetary boundaries is possible, and that will improve the health and well-being of billions of people. This could allow us to pass on to our children a viable planet. Thank you.